I am Dave Henning with the Fresh Start podcast. Trying to remember where I am here. Uh, oh, here I am in my studio. Uh, <laughs> fresh ideas for business and personal growth. I'm really glad today to have Pastor. Hey, my name is Tyler Feller. Dave, what an honor to be on your podcast today. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. Oh, Tyler, great to have you. And you are a lead pastor at a church in Southern Illinois. Yeah. M1 Church. Yeah. It's, it's McLeansboro First General Baptist Church. We call it M1 Church for short. Incredible M1. church full of amazing, wonderful people. And how did you start your journey into Christian ministry and your personal background growing up, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So I, like I had this dream whenever I was 10 years old that I would become the president of the United States. And you know, it's kind of a, a pretty audacious, you know, audacious dream for a 10 year old. In fact, I, I wore a suit to school uh, pretty often. And uh, I was in charge of putting our flags up and down on the pole. And on career day, I was dressed as the president because, you know, that's what I thought I was going to be. Or I, I thought first I'd become the governor of Missouri and then the president because I grew up in Missouri. And when we were taking our picture for career day, the counselor said to me, she said, uh, Tyler, what are you dressed up as? And she saw the tag I had that said president. Instead of saying president, she said, pra, pra, preacher. And what she was doing to me was instilling something in my heart that really I didn't know she was doing, but the Lord was implanting it. And it was this desire to, to work in ministry. And I actually started having dreams of me preaching and teaching from that point forward. And it was like the Lord was really you know, indwelling into the DNA of who I am about who I would become. Wow. That's amazing. Well, you know, there's still time to be president. I mean, you can, you can be, you can start when you're 72, if you want, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's (laughs) fine. I know I got plenty. After I retire from ministry, then I'll become the governor of Missouri, which I don't even live in Missouri anymore. And then I'll become the president. (laughs) Yeah. Why not? Right. (laughs) Exactly. Well, that is awesome. I mean, I've heard some really true historical stories of people that started preaching when they were very, very young. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, hey, that's fantastic. For me, uh, I, in high school, I wanted to be a disc jockey. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first time I preached a sermon, I was probably 14 years old, and I started preaching every Wednesday at this little church that I, that I grew up going to, and down a gravel road, because where I grew up, it's a population, 244 people. And all of these kids from my school started coming. They were driving uh, like literally like seven miles, some of them down gravel to get to us. And we grew to over 50 students. And when I was like 14 or 15, I baptized seven of my friends uh, wow. in our church. This is oh, incredible. Wow. Like the youth ministry was rivaling the size of the Sunday morning church tenants because, because what the Lord was doing, it was a call in somebody's life. They were obedient to it. And the Bible says, let nobody despise you because of your age. We need to not despise young people because even if they might not have all the natural wisdom that we expect, they have spiritual gifts that came from the most high place. And we need to be a society that honors that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you remind me of, uh, I was really struck and privileged to hear Dr. J. Edwin Orr from Fuller's Seminary. You know, he was a Scottish world evangelist, but he was a historian who knew all about all the great awakenings and documented yep. that. And you reminded me of Evan Roberts, who was a college kid. Uh-huh, and, uh-huh. and he felt like he was supposed to go home and share this message with the church. So he asked the principal, uh, you think that's God or the devil? And the, pre- the <laughs> president of the college says, the devil never talks by that, uh, like that, son. Let's go ahead and go home. So he goes home and his parents go, what are you doing here? Well, I'm supposed to preach to the youth in church. Well, we didn't hear about it. The preacher didn't announce it. <laughs> and, and it ended up being he had he had prayed with his roommate that God would give them 100,000 souls in one year, which yep. actually happened, the Great Welsh Revival. So, uh, you know, if you if you read about Evan Roberts, something that I thought was so powerful in that story is that soccer was really big in Wales. And the year that this revival took place in the history books, they quit playing soccer. And it says revival did not play because of what God was doing. And and he was even younger than a college student when he started because he was like 12 years old and he would go to the coal mines w- and worked with his dad. And when the coal miners went in, he would say, I want you to think about this verse today. And he would read them a Bible verse. They would go work for the day. And he's 12, 13 years old. And he would work with them when they got done at the end of the day. He would say, so what do you think about that verse? And that's really when revival started. He was embedding into the head, these people underground all day working, this Bible verse, and they would meditate on it and think on it. 
And it was God really teaching him the power of what the, the word can do. Isn't that just amazing? Um, just amazing, literally, literally. Tell me a little bit more about your journey for, you know, as you, you're a seven-year-old boy, uh, when you really felt that, you know, well, she's in fourth grade, so I think I was 10 years old. Preacher instead of president, boy, that shattered your dreams. <laughs> you know, in my mind, though, preachers were held to a higher regard than the president was to me. I mean, it's limited yeah. thinking, but to me, preachers had more authority than than the president did. And and honestly, like I could become the president of the United States and its impact are temporal because one day our nation will fall away. But if you build the church and you're a part of what God's doing, it lasts forever. So in a lot of ways, you know, pastors and preachers are more powerful than the president, though they might not feel like it. This is a very, as you know, a very unique time. And I see God's hand at work in so many uh, different ways. I look at the 20th anniversary of Michael W. Smith coming out with his first ever worship album, which he uh, he told God no initially, but God spoke to him, says, you're doing this. It came out on the on the day of 911 20 years ago. On Friday night, he's doing a, a big celebrate 20 year anniversary of that album. And it just blows my mind how God is moving in this time on stuff just like Evan Roberts on stuff that you're not going to see on TV on the six o'clock news. Yeah. You know, I'm a part of, of helping a film right now that's called sin proof. It releases next week, September 14th, actually. And it's about medical evidence of miracles and it's the top doctors. Some of them are atheists and skeptics and even people from Harvard are a part of the film, like the top of the top of the top people investigate a set of miracles and prove whether or not medically they were actually miracles or not. And some of them are, and some of them are not. And it's a really incredible mending in such a balanced way of the intellectual and the spiritual. And for some reason, spirituality has decided to just step away from intellectualism. And it's totally negated people that are living in ivory towers of the Ivy League institutions from what's happening in the spiritual world. But the beginnings and the origins of all of those universities were embedded into their DNA of who God was. And so we need to bring all of it back together. And exactly what you're talking about, media is so full of disinformation. It's hard for me to even know what to believe from any source. It's like, I want to hear from the actual source now. And so you're exactly right. We need to get back to truth. Well, and I've stood at the, at the gate at Harvard uh, back, back in the late 60s when I was a 17 year old going to college too young. And it says, it, you know, Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, all of those schools, well, preacher schools to, to train well, pastors. Yeah. Yeah. It's, right. That's the original, you know, it's, it's original. Intent. And what happens is people became too spiritual and started to neglect it. And those universities became really progressive and moved away from the gospel message. And I'm not saying that all those things are going to be restored, but I'm saying there should be a group of Christians that are willing to embrace the intellectual. And God's big enough to handle all of it. God's big enough to handle any questions that anybody has. I mean, if he created the whole universe, his shoulders are big enough to take the criticism that even a skeptic may have. And so I challenge anybody listening, go there with him and see what happens. Yeah. And so tell me about the film. When, where and what venue will it be released and when's it coming out? So it's coming out. The, the premiere of the film is going to be next week on September 14th in Pasadena, California. Uh, at the Ambassador Auditorium, but it's also going to be limited theatrical release, mainly in in independent uh, theaters, and there's going to be video on demand. So people, if they're interested, they can just go to sinproof.com and and check it out from there. Sinproof.com. That it sounds really eye opening. Unbelievable. And so, uh, tell me about your church at M1 there in Southern Illinois. Tyler Feller is with me today. What's what's yeah. going on? What's going on at church? Well, you know, we believe that God's called us to be the lifeblood of our community. And in a season right now where it's so trying and challenging for so many people, we've had awesome opportunities to do that. Like last week, the school had to go to online only mode because there are so many students with COVID, over 200 students in the school got COVID. And so it, it messed with the percentage of people that had to be there to, in order to have schools. So they went to online only mode. And there's so many people in our community were rural and it's, and it's, and there's a lot of poverty. 
So we were able to open up our church for folks who didn't have devices or internet, and we created an online learning center. So families could come drop their students off, they go to work or whatever. And then we had a team of people there that's going to help them with their homework and, and things like that. So in addition to being message carriers of the gospel and taking the great commission forth, which is telling people who don't know about Jesus, about Jesus, and then teaching them to follow him, we're being the lifeblood of our community, which is exactly the uh, other gospel mandate that he will uh, we people will know that we're disciples by the way that we love. And so we try to love our community really well. And you really have a connection with the with the music that I love, Brandon Lake and some of those guys over at Elevation Church and Carrie Joe. Yeah. And I, I I'm pa- you know, I'm crazy passionate about music all my all my life. And uh I actually uh the reason I got onto the podcast channel was I originally says I, I want to own my own radio station. And now that it's digital, I didn't need to buy mm-hmm. Get a building, brick and mortar, and transmitters, and so I, I built a rock and roll radio station from the same guy James Mulvaney over there in Manchester, England, and then I integrated it with with a Christian contemporary Christian music, and I found a Christian guy on Fiverr.com who who made like three hundred jingles for me. Wow! And, and then that evolved into the podcast channel, and that evolved into the connection thing, the matchmaking thing that we use to connect with each other. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I thought, you know, I, I was I've been involved with uh, Young Life for years and years, which is all about building relationships and relationship evangelism and sharing Christ with people who may not even know who Jesus is, may never ever seen a Bible or gone to church. And but the music, something about the music and the the words really connects us. Wouldn't you agree? It, you know, it's interesting how unifying music really is, and the enemy definitely tries to use it. For- you know, for his own ill purposes. And I'm ready for us as as believers to reclaim it, not just for worship music or for Christian contemporary music, but in all domains. I think it's it's why we look at people like Justin Bieber and Kanye West, who are in the secular audiences and what they're doing is so powerful and important. And instead of criticizing them because their discipleship doesn't look like a deacon or an elder in your church, we need to really celebrate what God's doing in their life. They might not be where we want them to be, but they're definitely not where they should be or had been had it not been for the grace of God over their life and their persistence to pursue him. And we know that music is unifying and God's put them on stages in front of more people than we can even count or dream of would come to our church online, even the big churches online. And, you know, we, we really need to support them. But you're right. Music is so, so unifying and, it, and it's important to embrace it. Yeah, I was just watching a YouTube video uh, of Justin Bieber and Shawn Mendes uh, get got together and did, did this uh, song, which was great. Uh, years ago, when I had the privilege of flying out of Logan Airport down to San Diego before John Maxwell wrote 110 books, he was pastoring Skyline Wesleyan Church. We had a private week of leadership with him. But his youth, the reason I tell you this is his youth pastor used to stalk rock and roll bands. And, wow. and and he'd, he'd drive up to L.A. whenever a big a big rock group was was playing and uh, he would he would knock on their door and he'd say, hey, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a groupie. I just I wanted to come in and say hello. And, and a lot of times we're having the after after concert party late at night. And say, yeah, come, they say, yeah, come on in. And he, and he'd, you know, he just kind of sit down with these guys and share Jesus. There was one group that uh, after their next album came out and uh, he had witnessed to them in a hotel room, a big party going on. And on the back of their al- first album, after he had met them, it said, we'd like to thank and all the credits. And then at the bottom says, we'd like to thank the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Wow. So, you know, and, and, you know, Mick Jagger was always has always been in the theology his whole life. I don't know if you know that or not, but I was watching Greg Laurie just interviewed Alice Cooper, who is a devout Christian whose dad is a pastor. And, you know, he he Cooper talks about how, you know, his life was that sex, drugs and rock and roll thing and how empty it was and how he really changed and stuff. So there's a lot of work to do. Wouldn't you agree? And it's there's something totally different when somebody meets Jesus for the first time and realize that they have been forgiven and yeah. and set free. And- you know what we need to do? We need to do a better job at looking at people's potential instead of their position. When I think about how Matthew was called by Jesus away from being a tax collector and into being a disciple, which is somebody he was training to become a rabbi, was he didn't look at his position, which was a corrupt tax collector who stole money from innocent people. It was his potential. He yeah. needed someone to see his potential. Maybe Matthew was born into that position. We don't know. Was his dad a tax collector? I don't know. We don't know that. 
was he one day going to be a priest? Because in Mark, it says his name was Levi, and that's a tribe that's assigned to priesthood. But what happened to Matthew was he becomes a tax collector. He's unclean. He's hated. He's cast out of the synagogue. But Jesus comes along and he sees him. And I love that movie, Son of God, because it shows Jesus sitting at a table uh, collecting money when Jesus shows up and, and calls him. And he sees Matthew. And what does he see? He doesn't see his position. He sees potential. Here's a man who travels a lot for his job. We're going to need that because we're about to travel to a lot of places. That's going to make him a good disciple. Here's a man who knows lots of languages because he has to speak Greek and Hebrew and Latin and probably whatever else is around at the time. It's going to help out because of where they're going to be going for ministry. This is a man who's connected to a lot of sinners. Well, in Luke 19, it says that Jesus came for sinners. That's why he came. So he looks at his position and he sees potential and he responds with purpose. We need to look at people's potential and respond with purpose. I posted a video on my YouTube channel of Sean Mendez, who was an atheist who heard a worship song from Maverick City and decided he wasn't an atheist anymore. And I and it, it, this video has 400,000 views, probably something like that now, or at least over 300,000 and hundreds of comments. And I can't tell you the number of comments that people have made that are derogatory because he didn't outright profess Jesus. I'm like, no, he's one step closer. We need to, instead of you know, demeaning him. We need to look at his potential. He was an atheist. And now because of this worship song, he believes Jesus is real. And if he does encounter Jesus, which God's going to send Kanye West and like you were talking about Justin Bieber to be around him, the potential that was embedded in him is going to come to pass. Yeah. It's so, it's so ridiculous. This whole, uh, this, the, that's what's killing the church is legalism and judging people. I mean, yeah. The death knell, the same exact thing happened years ago when B.J. Thomas accepted Christ, uh, you know, uh, brain drops keep falling on my head. And uh, he was just, you know, he's crit criticized by the Christian community, which is just so inappropriate. Uh, you know, Bob Dylan, when he accepted Christ and Chuck Smith was was mentoring him, but he kept the secret for some time. This is something that is crippling the church. And we look at society today and complain about what's happening. But imagine just just imagine for one minute. If people would see people like Jesus saw them, as what you just said, see them for who they can be, who they will be. You know, look at the greatest prayer in the in the Bible, in my, is, in, in my humble opinion, is when Stephen is getting stoned by rocks on his head and he's and he's, he prays, Father, forgive them. Yeah. And guess who's standing there? The yeah. Apostle Paul, the future Apostle Paul is standing there holding coats, the, you know, the coat, the coat room guy. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so much hope if we can just grab, you know, Jesus was tough, but he also was teaching, was teaching uh, love. You know, he didn't mince words a lot of times. And we, we think that meekness is weakness, but he was never weak. He was always meek. That's so true. I think there, there's a phrase that I like to use sometimes. It says honor is given and respect is earned. And I think one of the greatest things we can do as leaders is allow people to earn our respect but honor them for the potential they could go. Even people we don't respect, let's honor the potential that exists inside of them. And we need more people raising up people to live in what they can become, not what they are. I didn't mean to get on my soapbox there, but I get a little bit passionate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Imagine if every Christian would, would get, the, get the message, if I just win one person to the Lord in my lifetime of all the people that profess to be Christians. Oh, yeah. Holy revival. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, like it, they, there was a study that said if one family out of every church in America decided to foster a kid, there would be no foster care in America. And, and I know a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who made it their mission to end the foster care system in Tulsa, and it completely shut down a brand new building, a $10 million foster care facility they built in Tulsa got shut down because this church decided to make it a part of who they were. Isn't that, isn't it amazing what God's people can do when they're inspired and filled with the Holy Spirit and listening? You got to be yeah, listening. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a, in this season of my life, I'm learning to listen way more <laughs> than I talk. I'm, I talk a lot, you'll notice, but. <laughs> <laughs> what Jesus said, anyone with ears to listen should listen. We have two ears and one mouth. Let's listen twice as much as we talk. And one of the prayers that I pray all the time is speak, Lord, your servant is listening, which that comes right out of the Bible. And I add this tag to it and ready to respond. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening and ready to respond.
I write extensively in my book, actually the last chapter of my book, it's trying to set people up to be able to hear God. Uh, a lot of times what happens, we take off running and then we ask God to speak to us and we're likely running in the wrong direction. And he, what if we, our first mechanism all times, stop, listen, pray, seek, and then go. We don't do that. We go and then ask for a blessing or stamp of approval. That's not very honoring. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Where do you see the direction of, of your church and your ministry going now? And how can I help you? You know, what's interesting, when we think about the church of the future, it has to be more digitally integrated, but there has to be more touch points physically. And yeah. so it's a multi-pronged thing. It's like, we got to figure out how to mobilize people better and differently than we ever have before, but we also have to have a digital presence. And so we can't substitute the digital president without a lack of physical touch. Um, and so figuring that out, I think is going to be the challenge of the next 10 years. And I think people need to be more open to the way that Christianity and the Holy Spirit was expressed in the New Testament. And so that's going to be tough. It's going to be turbulent, I think, for a lot of people over the next few years. The best way, uh, I think, if I would say you could help me or listeners could help me, if you, if people are interested in, in growing in their own leadership or growing in their walk with God, I have a book coming out. It releases on November 16th. They can pre-order it now on my website, uh, tylerfiller.com, or it'll be on Amazon and everywhere else, walmart.com and everywhere else soon. Uh, it's called Don't Stop, and it is all about figuring out how we can make sure that if there's any resistance that's come against us in our life, that we haven't allowed it to, to prevent us from walking into everything that God has for us. So it's a blueprint to help people figure out their true calling and destiny. And tell me that website again, where they can get it. Uh, they can get it at tylerfeller.com. And there's a okay. thing there that says, don't stop book. And they just got to click on that. Tylerfeller.com. Hey, that's you. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's me. Let me ask you one more question be before we go. What was your very first job when you were a kid? <laughs> I was an undercover agent for the government, actually, was my very first job. And I would go into stores and buy cigarettes undercover. And then I would report basically back whether or not they sold to me. I had, a, I had a, another a undercover actual police officer that would go with me. And we rented a vehicle. And then we had a list of stores that the government would print out, send to us. And then we'd go out and we'd do like about 40 stores a day. We go out and I would buy these cigarettes undercover. <laughs> that was my first job. Uh, how old were you? Uh, I think I was 16. Right when I turned 16, they that's when, and I worked it until literally the day before I turned 18. Cause then after you turn 18, you can buy cigarettes. So, so I, at first I thought, uh, oh, come on, you're teasing me undercover agent at 16, but that for real, I was really an undercover agent. It was my first job. Yep. Did they pay you anything or just give you free yeah, cigarettes? No, I got paid a lot. Like <laughs> I got paid a lot. Oh, yeah. no free cigarettes? What's what's the deal? <laughs> yeah, I, it was a great job. I wasn't really allowed to tell my friends about it. My school was lenient. The the counselor knew about it. And so occasionally they'd let me miss school even to go work these jobs. Usually we would do them on the weekend or if we had a holiday from school, but a couple of times per semester, they would let me go in and work. But I was a good student, and so I didn't have any issues academically. So I didn't. It's not like I was going to be missing stuff. But I'd be gone a lot. Sometimes I'd be out working for the government undercover. Wow, that is amazing! Wow, that that's the best story yet. I mean, you wouldn't believe the interesting. I throw that question at the end, and it really takes people. A lot of very successful business people, entrepreneurs, and Christian leaders that I've had on my show, but. It's amazing the stories they come up with and tell of the, the very first thing, either as a teenager or even younger. But this one, uh, uh, yeah, you get the, you, you beat them all, I think. You undercover it age. It takes the cake, huh? So cool. Yeah, I can't come close to that, but I did get kicked out of high school. Before <laughs> 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 I had my own, I had my own underground newspaper and it was, and it was a little, it was a little sarcastic. So, uh, and when they caught, found that I had missed too many history classes, they said, you can come, come back for your final exams, but you're trespassing if you come on. So I had a little, you made me think of this undercover agent. I had this, this trench coat and a plastic fake cigar. And I, and I had to <laughs> walk into school and sign in at the principal's office. 
so I could take my final exams and, and leave. But that doesn't even compare to undercover agent. You know, I, you know <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm really jealous in a Christian kind of a way. So anyway, uh, anything else you'd like to share with us before we kind of wrap things up, Tyler? You know, Dave, I appreciate you. I appreciate your heart. I know that you're impacting leaders and uh, I know people are going to listen to this and, and be encouraged by you and just your general countenance and disposition. I just want to honor you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I would, I would ask for your prayers as well. I'm taking my podcast in a whole new, uh, whole new direction, like starting uh, next week. And so wow. just, I can explain that later, but uh, a lot of expats here from the United States that love the Lord. There's three fantastic churches that I participate in that are very evangelical and sharing the word. So pray for us and we'll pray for you. That's what God says to do, encourage one another as the day draws near, right? Absolutely. Provoke each other onto good works. Tyler Fowler, thank you for being my guest. Appreciate you, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.